Pearl Pinson was a 15-year-old from Vallejo, California. She was a typical 21st century teenager who had two siblings. On the morning of May 25th, 2016, on her way to school, Pearl was attacked and taken away by Fernando Castro. He was eventually killed by police. She was never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. Although the public perception may be different, crimes committed against people are usually perpetrated by people the victims know. For women, they are usually raped and or murdered by men who are in their social circle. If your house or apartment is ever broken into while you're out, the best choice for the intruder is someone you know. When men get into fights at bars, sporting events, or Nickelback concerts, those altercations are with other men whose names they already know. The stats are clear and not in doubt. However, as law enforcement uses DNA to solve more and more older violent crimes, going back to the 1980s, 70s, and beyond, we are discovering that many of these illegal acts have been committed by people the victims didn't know. I'm not saying those revelations are enough to change our thinking, but they are certainly enough to consider them an option when examining disappearances we cover on Unfound. Well, in the case of Pearl Pinson, there is no mystery as to who caused her disappearance. The man's name is Fernando Castro, and he's dead now. But Pearl is still missing, almost five years later. And we're left to not only figure out where she is, but what went so wrong with these two strangers on a street. And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Good's website, charlieproject.org. If you ever got to meet Pearl Pinson, she would have been your typical teenager. She had occasional tussles with her siblings, but down deep, she had their back. Pearl didn't much like school for the education, but she enjoyed the social aspects. And concerning school, like most teenagers who can't drive yet, Pearl walked to the bus stop, a journey of about a half mile. However, she rarely did this alone. Pearl's younger brother, also on his way to school, usually accompanied her. So on May 25th, 2016, it was a morning like every other except Pearl's brother lagged behind, while Pearl was eager to meet her friends at the stop. Thus, she left for school alone. Witnesses state that Pearl was about halfway to her destination when Fernando Castro attacked her. When someone tried to stop him, Fernando pointed a gun at the person. As this witness ran off, he heard a gunshot. Knowing who Pearl was, the same person rushed to her parents' house. In minutes, Pearl's father and uncle were at the scene. But Pearl wasn't there. All that was left were splatters of blood and her phone. She was never seen again. Over the next 24 hours, Fernando and his car were spotted in the vicinity of Vallejo. However, police did not track him down until Fernando was over four hours south in the San Luis Obispo area. A shootout occurred, and Fernando was killed. Pearl was not in his car, and there were no clues as to where she could be. Unlike most of Unfound's episodes, there is no doubt who the perpetrator is, and there's no doubt where he is and what he did after the disappearance. However, Pearl is still missing. And because this podcast is called Unfound and not Unsolved, 
we will work as hard as ever to figure out how Pearl can be located. That begins with trying to answer these three questions. Number one, what caused Fernando to target Pearl, a girl he didn't know? Number two, with there being evidence that Fernando planned this attack, why has no information been found as to where he could have put Pearl's remains? And number three, even though none of us were there, should police have used extra care in not killing Fernando, given that he could have revealed Pearl's location? Pearl's family has their own opinions as to where Fernando put her remains but they are open to all sensible suggestions. The guest for this episode is Pearl's father, James Pinson. Unfound news. I hope you didn't miss it, but yesterday I did another fantastic interview with Dr. Telesco. We got to speak about the disappearance and murder of Janelle Matthews, and we of course spent quite a bit of time talking about Steve Pankey and my interview I did with him in October 2019. If you missed yesterday's program, please find it on the Fischler College of Education and School of Criminal Justice YouTube channel. Next, this is the last episode of March, so you know what that means. By the time you hear the next one, you will have gotten Unfound's April 2021 newsletter. If you'd like to be on the email list, please let me know at unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. Finally, the project I have spoken about on the live show and previous episodes is slowly taking flight. Here are some of the disappearances myself and the Think Tank members will be reinvestigating with the hopes of finding new information. Rebecca Gary, Eric Franks, Ashley Eifert, and Helen Diamond. I want to thank all of these people for donating some of their extra time to the cause. Where you can find Unfound. Unfound supports accounts on Podomatic, iTunes, Spotify, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Deezer, and YouTube. Speaking of YouTube, on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, please join us for the Unfound live show. All of you can talk with me and I can answer your questions. Contribute to Unfound at patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. This week, I need to thank Danny. You can also contribute at PayPal, paypal.me forward slash unfound podcast. The email address, unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. Merchandise, the books at amazon.com in both ebook and print form. Do not forget the reviews. Shirts at unfound podcast myshopify.com or you can track down my assistant Heather in the Facebook group. Playing cards at makeplayingcards.com forward slash sell forward slash unfound podcast. The website theunfoundpodcast.com and please mention unfound at all true crime websites and forums. Thank you. I'm so happy to have on this episode of Unfound the father of Pearl Pinson, James Pinson. James, welcome to Unfound. Thank you. Let's uh, just, uh, as we usually do on Unfound, we usually talk about uh, the missing persons family uh, as a whole first. You are, of course, uh, Pearl's father. How many children do you have? Where does she fall in the line? Let's talk about that first. I have three children. Okay. And how, what are their ages, including Pearl? Okay, uh, Pearl would have been 20 this year. I have a daughter that Rose, who's 22, and William would be 19 this year. Wow, okay. All right, and um, they all get along back in the day, or very? were they different, similar? How would you portray your children? They fought with each other all the time, but... Uh, when it came down to it, they had each other's back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, of course, we're going to uh, get to at least talk about one of uh, the, the brother of Pearl here uh, regarding the disappearance because uh, we're going to find out that she he usually walked with her to school but was not with her that day, and that will come up 
a little later. Okay, so you have three kids, and um, so let's move on to talking about Pearl in particular. We have to remember that she was 15 years old when she went missing uh, in on May 25th of 2016. How would you describe, uh, to the listeners, how would you describe Pearl at being right there in the middle of her teens, her personality, interests, things like that? Uh, she's a typical girl, you know, she likes to um, get dressed up and do her makeup on all the time. Yeah, so, okay. Yeah. And, okay. yeah, what, what were interests? Was she into, uh, I just have to ask, if this is going to be very stereotypical, but uh, cheerleading, into music, uh, you know, things like that, some of her interests. Uh, she wasn't into cheerleading, but she had friends that were cheerleaders. Um, she listened to basically any type of music. Yeah. Yeah, did she like the music uh, that you listened to, or did she not? was she not into Dad's music? Dad's music was a little too hard rock for her. <laughs> okay. All right, I know that feeling, okay, even though I don't have any kids, but I, I probably have a similar taste to you. Okay. All right, so she's 15-year-old. Would you say Would you say that she was uh, doing well in school? Was she well-behaved? Any uh, any issues with school or anything like that? Typical teenage drama. Okay, with, with boys and uh, haters and things like that? She had haters, she had boyfriends. Typical teenager, it sounds like to me. How uh, did she do in school? Of course, uh, May 25th, I'm guessing that she was getting to the end of the school year. Uh, what grade was she in? Uh, she was in ninth. Ninth? And how was she doing? Uh, she's doing okay. Okay, doing okay. All right. Yeah, she had between D's and C's. Okay. Now, we have not, of course, you are her father. Uh, what about uh, Pearl's mother? Uh I don't. I've not ever asked you, but are you two uh, still married, or did mother play a role in in Pearl's life? Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, her mother was there, but her mom had had uh, health issues. Oh. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll just leave it at that. All right. So you would say that you were primary, the primary uh, custodian of Pearl, then? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. And. And how? And uh, at the time of her disappearance, who was all living in your house there in in Vallejo, California? It was uh, me, Pearl's mom, and um, her brother and sister. Okay. All right. So let's move on uh, to this. So typical teenager. Um, and once again, listeners know I do not have any children, so um, uh, I'm a little uh, lost probably on that topic a little bit. But she has siblings uh, that she seemed to get along with. They have each other's back. Typical teenager there in Vallejo, uh, California. So let's move on to this. Uh, I think that something that really popped up uh, in our discussion so far, Jim, uh, up until this interview, was that in the weeks before her disappearance, so let's just say maybe going back to the beginning of May of 2016, at some point, uh, you told me that, uh, I don't know if she exactly told you one-on-one, uh, -on -one, but maybe she told her mother that she thought she was being followed. Is that correct? She thought somebody was watching her. You know. Huh. So well, she said she felt like someone was watching her. Um, you know, I told her it was in her head, you know, which I shouldn't have. Mm-hmm. Did she give you uh, any specifics? Was it when she was going to school or when she was going out with her friends? I mean, how specific did she get or did she just keep it uh, very general? She kept it very general. Hmm. Okay. Did you ever have any chance, um, you know, before, of course, before she disappeared, to ever uh, to ask any of her friends about it, ever talk to any of her friends' parents? about it any names ever come up anything like that no hmm okay um and we should understand um being that you've told me and once again this will come up in a little bit that she did usually walk to school with her brother um yep. did her brother ever witness anything or did he know what she he was she was telling you did she did he ever say oh she's full of it or anything like that? Could she he corroborate anything? 
No, he said he didn't tell me anything. Hmm. Okay. All right. And do you uh, now after the fact after she went missing, um, did you find out that she had been told any told any other people that have her friends ever come forward and say yeah she told me that too anything like that? No, they didn't. Okay. All right. So she's uh, we're not sure what you know all exactly this means. Uh, I I you know I've tried to. Uh, I think that on this topic, it's so general, I don't know what to, to think of it. You know, it would have, of course, been nice if Pearl had given you some specifics, but you were the one there, she's your daughter, you had the conversations with her, and that's about all we know, right? That's yeah. about it. That's about it. All right. How many times would you say before she went missing that she told you this? Just once, twice, or? Uh, about three times. Three times. Okay. Where how how worried were you about this or did you just think this was uh Pearl being a little dramatic? Just be honest. She knew it was being dramatic because uh, at times she didn't want to go to school because she oh. was having problems with the school. Mm. All right, so let me just ask. So you maybe thought that she was saying this so she could get out of going to school? Yes. Okay. Well, I think that's a, probably a typical uh, parent reaction, uh, especially yeah. when she can't be uh, too specific about what she's saying. It, it starts to sound maybe like, a, 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 of course, like BS, and, and maybe you might have some guilt about that now. But I think at the time, in early May of 2016, I don't think that – your reaction, you know, was, you know, was crazy. Of course, we still don't know if she was talking about Fernanda, who we're going to talk about in a second or not. We, we don't know that, right? We have no idea if that's what she meant or not. No idea. Okay. All right. So on that topic, let's move on to Fernando Castro. Um, and we want to make this very clear. And I'm just going to ask you point blank. Is there any proof that Fernando and Pearl knew each other, ever ran into each other, knew of each other at all, before May 25th, 2016? No, the, the police went to her phone, to her uh, websites and everything, and I talked to all her friends, and everyone said they, they didn't know each other. Mm -hmm. All right, so... Even, even so, the private investigator didn't find anything out. Okay, and so this uh, Fernando, for example, was not her boyfriend or anything like that? No. All right, because as you would probably know, a lot of young women and grown women do go missing because of the boyfriend's husband's exes in their lives. This yeah. is not that type of situation. Once again, he was a guy kind of from the neighborhood, but he was a little bit older. But nobody has ever in the last almost five years been able to prove that Pearl and Fernando knew each other at all. Nobody. Okay. All right. So your belief is then that when he attacked her, and once again, we're going to get into that, when he attacked her on her way to school on that day is the first time they had any interaction. As far as I know. Okay. All right. So let's move on to this. Let's talk about Fernando in general. Where is he from? What did, uh, well, maybe I should ask you this. Before this ever happened, had you ever heard of Fernando Castro or his family, because they are kind of from the in the same area. Had you ever heard of any of them before? I've never even seen them before. You know, and we're, they were about a half a mile from from my house. Okay. You know, and mm -hmm. you know, I, I bear, we barely even knew our neighbors. You know. Right. Okay. And we have to remember this is Vallejo, California. It is a decent sized city. In fact, I think if anybody has heard of Vallejo, California, in fact. Uh, James and I were talking about this right before we started the interview. I think of Vallejo, California. I start thinking back to the 1960s and 70s with the Zodiac Killer, who was in that area at one time. Uh, that's what comes to my mind, but it's a decent-sized city, so somebody being a half mile away, they might as well be 100 miles away. Oh, yeah. You know, with, with so many people uh, in, in the city. Okay. So had no your uh, daughter uh, Pearl had no idea of this family. You had no idea of this family. Nobody else in, in, in had any idea of uh, Fernando or his family. So let's talk about Vern Fernando in general. Uh, he's from uh, once again right in that area, about a half mile away. But what have you learned about his history uh, in the preceding weeks and months, maybe even years, 
before he attacked your daughter on May 25th. What have you learned about him? One thing I learned is that uh, when he was in high school, he was a loner. Um, he pretty much kept to himself. No one wanted to talk to him. He was bullied uh, when he was in high school because he was a loner. Um, we found out shortly after he took her that uh, he, he had uh, some mental issues. You know, he would hide in bushes and try to call people in the bushes with him. Wow. Uh, have you ever, ever been able to find out the Vallejo police or maybe the county police or whoever uh, had many run-ins with him in the preceding year, for example, or, or not? Do you know? The sheriff's department who was handling on the case, they never uh, told me anything about his uh, criminal history if he had one. Okay. Uh, any proof uh, that he might have been into drugs, or was this, uh, maybe to put it more simply, just some sort of mental illness that he had? Do you even know? Nothing that anybody was able to prove. Nothing. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And you had told me, uh, the way you would describe it, uh, is that his family knew that he had these issues, but they kept kind of blowing it off and pushing him off on other people in their family? Is that That's what, what I was told. That's what you were told. Okay, yeah. so they were not uh, confronting Fernando about this. They were not trying to get him help, once again, to your knowledge. That's my knowledge. Okay. All right, so this is the guy. He's in the neighborhood, um, but it's not clear if he's ever uh, attacked any other women. Uh, of course, he was out, uh, out in the public that day uh, that, um, you know, that he did what he did to Pearl. So we just uh, are not sure about what led to all of this. No proof that he has a, a deep criminal history, but it does seem that he had some things going on mentally. Let's uh, move on now to Pearl's walk to school. Can you describe that maybe? How long was the walk? Did, was she walking to the school or was she walking to the bus stop? Uh, what time did she usually leave every day? What, what can you tell the listeners about that? Uh, she, she left every day about 6.45. The, the bus stop was maybe a minutes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, sorry about the noise. Um, you know, the one thing that the media, you know, you know even the, you know, the news channels always got wrong was they thought she went over the overpass to go to school. Mm -hmm. And she went the opposite way of the overpass. Okay. And I'm going to end. The listeners should know that I will be doing... Uh, a YouTube video for this to describe uh, this area. I've already uh, taken a look at it through Google Maps as well, but I will be doing a YouTube video uh, supplement for this disappearance that will be on the Unfound Podcast channel so people can see this area f for themselves. But yeah. once again, could you say uh, in minutes how long this walk was to the bus stop again? Maybe approximately 10 minutes. 10. It depends on how fast she walked. Okay. And in to your knowledge, in all the years that she was uh, walking that uh, route, ever have any problems, any issues at all? No. None. Zero. Okay. And But there is something else, and I've already kind of mentioned it. Usually she was walking with her younger brother? Yes. Okay. And he, he, he was in junior high, and they would leave at the same time, so... She can get on the bus, and he walked to school, which is about another half mile away. Okay, so he didn't get on the bus. He was walking to the school, and she was walking to the bus. They were going to two different yes. schools. Yes. Okay. All right, so they're together. You have to feel pretty good about that. And then when she would come home, uh, would it be the same thing? She would get dropped off at the same spot and then just same spot. And, and walk home? Yeah. Okay. All right, so she's in this pattern, and uh, we know uh, many times if there are bad people out there, usually men, uh, if they can determine patterns that, that makes it more likely that um, they could, you know, stalk somebody or, of course, uh, women, uh, girls, anybody. Okay, so we just have to uh, remember that. So, but on that day, May 25th, 2016, Pearl's brother was not with her. What um, would you say this was an uh, an odd occurrence, a rare occurrence, that he was not walking with her that day? How would you uh, describe that, and why did that happen? What happened? 
Uh, she she wanted to hurry and get to the bus stop so she could talk to her friends before she went to school. And he was using the restroom. I mean, he was out the door, you know, less, less than three minutes after she left. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So she wanted to get there. She wasn't willing to wait for her younger brother. She was going to walk herself, and that was that. Yeah. Okay. And so on that morning, you said that she usually left about 6.45 a.m.? And yes. then on that morning, as we know, and this, uh, I, I have to say that this uh, disappearance is unique in Unfound's history due to the circumstances, but she was walking and she encountered Fernando. The way, now there are witnesses, what do you know? Uh, I would never ask you to go into deep detail, but the way you understand it, there are witnesses. What have these witnesses said about what they witnessed that morning? Okay, the, the the one witness that uh, the police talked to him twice mm -hmm. uh, on the nine one one calls. Um, he seen Fernando grab her, and he went to help her. And he, Fernando pulled a gun. Mm -hmm. um, a short time later, the guy heard a gunshot, and he was running back to his house, which ain't too far from me. Mm -hmm. And um, he happened to see, see my brother talking to somebody, and he said, "I just seen a girl, a girl with uh, green hair, get shot." That got my daughter's hair. Died you know, wow. green, and my brother Aaron came and got me, and we went looking for her right away. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if I could ask you, uh, this witness, uh, did he, and there are two witnesses, but this witness, did, did he portray it as if Fernando was just like standing there in the street, and, you know, or, or did he come up behind her, or do we even, uh, did that witness even see that? Do we even know? I, all I know is the, the witness uh, said that he seen her, him grab her. He didn't say where. Okay. Uh, my family has never been able to talk to the witness. Uh, oh, okay. All the information we got that is through the sheriff's department. Okay. I'm, okay. So you've not been able to talk to this witness. Okay. And what and what is the cross streets? What is the intersection near where this happened? What are the streets? Okay. It was Reese and Homemakers. Okay, and I will, uh, of course, be once again be uh, showing that on uh, a video uh, using Google Maps. So Pearl's just doing what she should be doing, going to school. Fernando just happens to be out there in the street. He attacks her. This witness tries to help. Fernando pulls a gun. The, the person backs off and runs away, and then he hears this gunshot. Then you find out about what's going on, and... What were you doing at the time? Were you going to work? Were you just hanging out at home? And, and and describe those minutes when you find out that something was going on with Pearl down the street. I was sitting on the couch in the front room. And when I heard, heard you know, when my brother came and got me, and we went out automatically looking, and we didn't find nothing at first until uh, my brother went over the overpass and found the blood splatter. Okay. So who, uh, do you know who, uh, I would never say, uh, ask you to say the person's name, even if you know it, but who was this witness? I can't remember the guy's name, I'll be honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was, it was uh, one of the kids that uh, knew Fernando. Uh, that's how we were able to find where uh, he lived right away. All right, so what you're saying is this, vi this witness who tried to stop Fernando from attacking Pearl actually knew Fernando? Yes. Wow. And even so, uh, Fernando um, threatened this guy with a gun. Yes. Okay. All right. So you you uh, find out what's going on. You and your brother uh, rush out there fairly quickly. How many minutes would you say you got to that intersection after this happened? How fast? Would after you... after uh, we found out about was it at the intersection within three minutes. Three minutes, and. Oh. Did you see any, did you see Fernando? Did you see your daughter? Anything? Nothing. Okay. All right. And we should state that two people, two different people called 911. Yes. All right. So we already know the one person that knew Fernando. Do you uh, have any description of the other person? No, I don't. I know it's a lady, I believe. Okay. So two people saw this happen. And so you go to the scene, and you have told me, and once again, I, I don't want to get too deeply into this because I know this is very, very difficult. But uh, did you see any evidence of, uh, of an attack, of violence, of, of any kind at, 
in the, where you where you ran to? Where we first ran to, um, well, she probably had two phones. She had one that was her regular phone for her talking, and she had one she listened to music on. And we found the phone that she listened to music on at the bottom, of, at the entrance to the overpass, the pedestrian overpass. Wow. Okay. And uh, my understanding is that uh, she had a backpack with her. Did she have a purse? Any other possessions uh, that you she found? Had backpack. She had a Just backpack. Her backpack. Okay. Yeah. And was it found at the scene? No, it was not. Okay. All right. So you're there. You've been told that your daughter uh, has been attacked by this guy Fernando, who you once again, who you don't know, she doesn't know. And what do you do next when you, um, you know, can't find her? Maybe you're yelling her name, et cetera. Uh, what do you do next? Uh, we, we put a call in the sheriff's department. Okay. Uh, we called them, let them know that uh, what we were told. And the time we got there, back down there to the uh, scene, uh, Blail PD was already there, and they handed everything over to the sheriff's department. Okay. And being that these two 911 calls were made, how long did it take police to show up to that intersection? I would say less than five, ten minutes. All right, so kind of quickly, but not really, really quickly. You know, yeah. I, of course, we don't know where they were at the time, where the local, being, local car was, but... Being a parent, it took too long. Yeah, of course. Of course it did. Yeah, of, of course it did. And in fact, I know in a prior conversation, you told me that might have even been longer than that. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, all right, so 911 call about a girl getting attacked by a guy, and uh, you get there before the police get there. Yes. Okay. All right, so you're there, and uh, did you see any other uh, evidence of, uh, of course, this witness said that he heard a, a gunshot. Um most likely coming from Fernando, which is, is uh, of course, is very bad news. But did you see any blood or anything at, at the location? I did not personally get to see the uh, crime scene okay. uh, entirely until um, almost three hours later. Okay. And your brother was there. Did your brother see any, any, any things like that? He said he seen, seen blood. Okay. And this was on this overpass that you've just mentioned? Yes. Okay. Uh, in those uh, first minutes, you're there, the police get there. Um, were they uh, able to determine uh, what direction Fernando took your daughter? Did they start, lo start looking over on the other side of the highway following this walkway? Did they go over there in those initial moments, or did that take some time? Do you know? From what I was told, that they started searching right away, uh, all up and down 780. Mm. Um, they, they searched there, they searched the bushes underneath the overpass. Um, I guess that's where they found her phone at. Okay. Okay, so she had two phones. Were both phones eventually found or not? Yeah, they found both phones. Both phones. One you said was right there, close, and then they found another one somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, uh, but, like, within the vicinity, I guess, yeah. in the direction that he took her. Okay. So we know right away, so it was known, uh, just some questions for you. So it was known right away that Fernando Castro was responsible for this. Uh, yes, sir. All right. After, and, after, they, talked, after they talked to the, uh, the one eyewitness, uh, they, they had a search warrant for his house within hours. Okay, very good. Okay. And so you knew it, your brother knew it, the witness, of course, who knew Fernando uh, was the one who identified him. Uh, was there a description of Fernando's car out fairly quickly with his license plate, etc.? No. Not that I know. They, they, we didn't find out what kind of car he was in for several hours later. Uh, looking back at it now, any reason it took that long? Any ideas that you, you can say? Uh, one thing I could really remember what the chef said, that they can't release too much information because it's an ongoing investigation. Yeah. All right. So, so even though this, for example, even though this witness knew Fernando, this witness could not identify the, the car that Fernando might have been driving. No. All right. Okay. But was the, was the suspicion at the time that he did take Pearl Way in a vehicle or did they think that 
he was uh, carrying her somewhere right on the streets there, Vallejo somewhere. And he... Um, there was a witness that lived across the street from the overpass on the other side of 780. Yeah, I saw the car parked there at the bottom of the overpass. And um, she said she saw, saw somebody put something in the trunk. Wow. Yeah. And she didn't realize it was Pearl until hours later. Okay. All right. Now, uh, here's another point re probably regarding the car. Um, but you had told me that you already told me, uh, told the listeners that the police, um, got to his house within hours once again, because, uh, he could be identified, but an Amber alert was not issued right away. Uh, can you, do you, to this day, do you know why? I have no idea. They said, they first told me that it took him a while to get a description and the license plate of the car. Um, uh, you know, it's 36 hours before they even put an, um, Amber alert out. Okay. Yeah. So to this day, once again, we're doing this interview on March 21st, 2021. Uh, to this day, you're, you're still not sure. No. All right. Because I think the listeners, uh, all very educated uh, regarding disappearances, especially Amber Alerts, know that those those are usually put out within minutes, maybe hours, yeah. maybe a few hours, maybe, but minutes. Yeah, they, they had all, all points bulletin put out, you know, mm -hmm. a description of Fernando, but they did not have... Uh, description of the car, you know, out okay. right away. Okay. All right. So this is, uh, I think, this is a, certainly a big deal uh, in this uh, disappearance that the Amber Alert took as long as it did. And it seems to me, by the time the uh, the Amber Alert was issued, it seems to me they were on to Fernando uh, already. And we'll get into what happened next. But um, what goes on for that rest of the day? So we're we're talking like seven in the morning, seven thirty in the morning. So what goes on for you, your family, uh, the rest of that day on on May twenty fifth of twenty sixteen? What do you do? What, what goes on? Before they found her phone, um, I was still in disbelief. I went up to her school to see if she was there. I kept on calling her phone. Mm -hmm. I searched out the place she hung out, and then the sheriff's uh, asked asked me to call her phone, mm -hmm. and when I did. They found it. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And this was not, this was the phone that, she, it wasn't the phone she listened to music to, this was a different phone that was found later. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, as we've already talked about, your son was supposed to be with her. Uh, I'm guessing that you uh, kind of shielded him, shielded him away from all of this, even though he was supposed to be going to school, or what, what, what happened there? Okay, uh, he's he he left. Like I said, he left about three minutes after she did. Mm-hmm. Uh, he turned the corner, walked towards the bus stop, you know, hoping to catch up with her, and he heard a gunshot. You know, he's been about the same nothing until later on that afternoon because we didn't tell him after he got out of school what happened to his, with his sister. Wow. All right, so he, so he ended up going to school that day. Yes. He didn't. He didn't really even at the time know what had happened. No. All right. Wow. Okay. All right. So for the rest of the day, once again, you're you're doing what you can do. You've already explained that. Um, now, on, but on that day, while you're doing what you're doing, are there any sightings of Fernando in his car on that particular day, May twenty fifth, twenty sixteen? The only sightings that I know of that it was uh, the police found days later because they checked uh, neighbors' uh, surveillance cameras and they seen his car going up towards. Uh, Blanco Road, and um, the other side they spotted, it wasn't turned over to the Sheriff's Department until like almost six months later, before the Petaluma Police released it to, uh, down to the Sheriff's Department, but uh, the car was seen at 9 o'clock in the morning uh, out in Petaluma. And how far is, it, for those of us who don't live in the air, how far is, far is Petaluma uh, from Vallejo? I believe it's like 20, 25 miles. 25 miles, so... Roughly, he's attacking your daughter at 7 in the morning, and then his car is being spotted in Petaluma about a couple hours later. Yeah, between 8.30 and 9. Okay, but you didn't find out about this till long time later, six months later. Yeah, about, about six months later, they had a uh, tie mm -hmm. of him. Okay. You know, okay. Uh, I guess the Sheriff's Department has volunteers. They do uh, they watch these uh, uh, cameras that they have. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's how they spotted the car there. And they spotted the car in um, Bodega Bay the next morning. Okay. Were you in your car uh, riding around looking for eventually later that day or looking for him? Um, so. Yes, I was. Okay. And you said that the police went to Fernando's family's house, the Castro's. Uh, within hours, they had a warrant, uh, maybe going to his house. Maybe they were expecting to find uh, Fernando and uh, Pearl there. We just don't know. But what what have you found out that they said when the police show up and say, hey, Fernando did this, uh, do you know what their his family's reaction was to all of this on that day? From what I was told, was denial. That he wouldn't do something like that? Yes. And uh, were they, in, in your opinion, were they helpful at all in trying to say, well, you know, he's not here, but here's where he might be. Were they ever, were they able to offer up any idea where Fernando was on that day? Uh, I have no idea where he was at. Uh, they were slow getting the information of what vehicle he was in. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right, so we get through uh, that day of May 25th. Um, you're worried as any parent can ever be worried about anything ever. Um, I'm sure you're, you know the rest of your family is just crazed. Uh, his family's not very helpful. There's a couple sightings of Fernando's car, but uh, not obvious at the time. So we move into the next day, and um, maybe I should ask you this. Was there a... A sighting at San Rafael Bridge. Where and where is that? San, San Rafael Bridge. Um, it's about fifteen miles from here. Uh, they spotted his car there on one of the uh, freeway cameras. Okay. And he was seen getting off the freeway at Sir Francis Drive. Um, it's the last last sighting they had of him until after uh, the Amber Alert went out. Okay, and so the San Rafael Bridge sighting would be would have been on the twenty fifth, or was that the next day? That was on the twenty sixth. That was on the next day. All right, so let's talk about that then. So, on the twenty sixth, um, they're be on the lookout, and for him, I guess they finally did get a description of his car and his and, and the license plate, and yeah. there was a camera that did catch him on the San Rafael Bridge at this one particular exit. In in what jurisdiction is that? What town is that? San Rafael. Um, Do you know? Okay, the San Rafael Bridge of me, uh, it's in um, Contra Costa County where it starts at and it ends in um, Marin County. Okay. All right. And once again, the listeners, I will be d- detailing all of this for you. So you probably listen to part of this and then can go look at the, the map uh, as well uh, that I will be doing. Okay. So then uh, on the 26th, uh, somehow, not all the, all the, only are there sightings on cameras, but it seems that at least one police officer was paying attention and did uh, see Fernando in his car. Where was this sighting? And, of, of course, they give chase. Where did that happen? And, and did you find out right away when it happened? Where were you on the 26th when this went down? It was me, me and my wife at the time. I uh, was sitting in the house when um, the sheriff's department got a call that they spotted Fernando's car in Southern California, San Luis Obispo County. And that, uh, not, someone called 911 because they spotted, they seen the Amber Alert. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Amber Alert went out like 2.30 and by 3 o'clock, uh, they already had a hit on it. Okay. And my understanding is San Luis Obispo is like three hours away? Long ways away. Uh, it's, it's a drive. I'm not sure for sure. How, how far away it is. No, it's, it's not close. It's not, no. con- it's not, San, it's not Marin County. It's not Contra Costa County. It's not, it's well it's far several away. County, several counties away. Yeah, several counties away in San Luis Obispo. That's getting down near LA. Okay. Yeah. And this is going in where you live, where this is all take place is up towards San Francisco. Once again, just yeah. to generalize it for all non-California people. Okay. So the Amber Alert worked. They cite him. Uh, this chase starts. What do you know uh, about this chase and, and how it concluded? Okay, uh, what I know is what was released to me by the sheriff's department that they, the, I, the witness they called the 911 uh, followed the car until the uh, highway patrol got there. A chase uh, pursued. Uh, they chased him into, uh, I can't remember the name of the town, but uh, they chased him.
in the jail, dead end where he wrecked the car and he got out and ran into the uh, trailer park. Wow. And uh, he ended up busting into one of these trailers where a woman was living by herself? Uh, yes. Okay, and what what happened there then? Uh, he held the lady hostage for a minute and he let her go. Um, he started to write something on the table and, and um, with a marker and he, he, they said they could see where it was erased. Mm -hmm. uh, short time later, he, he got the keys to the lady's truck and um, tried leaving, running from the police and that's when the shootout began. Wow. He was shooting out with the cops as he was running in the trailer. And I was told that they hit him once in the leg uh, as he was going into the trailer. Mm -hmm. And so it ended up being like uh, very familiar with, uh, of course, YouTube videos that show being that we all have all these cameras. Of course, uh, cops wear badge cams and everything today. So he comes out, gets in this truck, tries to get away, and they shoot him dead. Yeah, they shot him um, 10 times. The officer I talked to in San Bernardino County, yeah. Yeah. Um, he uh, was proud of it. You know, yeah, it was all 10 kill shots, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I just can't believe he said that, you know. They, right. They, they, they knew the importance of, of getting him tied. And uh, they didn't do that. No. Okay. All right. Uh, at that scene, of course, there was his car uh, that he wrecked and then fled. Uh, I guess they searched the car. Pearl, not there. No. Okay. Any clues at all um, at in the car uh, or in this trailer or in this truck? Any clues to all at all as to where to search for Pearl? Any clues as to where... Uh, he might have put her or her, you know, status at that time. Anything at all? Uh, they found handwritten ins instructions in the car on how to get to Jenner, California. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jenner, California. Is that near San Luis Obispo? Is that closer to you? Where is Jenner, California? It's on the other side of Vallejo. It's in um, Sonoma County. All right. So that's nowhere near San Luis Obispo either. No. Okay, is there any, being that you did, uh, they did find this, uh, these uh, these directions to Jenner, uh, um, was it a specific address, um, Any anything, did they go look there, uh, what did they do with that in piece of information? Uh, the, the, on the handwritten instructions, it just had instructions how to get there, but when they did a search of his, uh, Google search on his uh, computer at home, Mm-hmm. Uh, they had his address, but the police never released that address to us. Okay. All right. So, is there any proof that, once again, to your knowledge, um, that that um, Fernando and or uh, Pearl were ever in Jenner, California, on the twenty fifth or the twenty sixth? Any uh, on the twenty sixth, they caught it at a gas station camera. Mm -hmm. of, um, coming in, into uh, Bodega Bay and turn around going back towards Jenner. Okay, so it is possible that he, not only did he write those directions, but it's very possible that he did end up there at some point after attacking Pearl and taking her. Yes. Okay. All right, so we have this attack. We have this period of time, it seems to me, where Fernando is out of contact. He might have been seen a couple times on videos here and there but of course they're not don't know where he was every second and then this amber alert finally goes out should have been out a day before that at least and then uh the shootout happens and fernando ends up deceased and no clues as to what he did with pearl no all right, so that is the situation. Uh, I have a lot of goings, a lot of happenings with Fernando fleeing and these sightings and the Amber Alert and this chase and everything. But um, the reason, of course, we're doing this interview is because Pearl's still missing. So let's talk about the rest of the case uh, by st uh, by um, starting here. Uh, of course, this is 2016. Uh, I, I heard that Fernando even had more than one phone. But those phones were no help in trying to track uh, where he went. Why is that? 
Uh, apparently, uh, when I was told by the sheriff's department, uh, he did a, he would search on tracking. He on did. GPS and he left, left both his phones at home. All right. So he he knew that it, he it, it seems then that he was planning to attack someone. We don't know if it was Pearl specifically or some other young woman or whoever. But he yeah. was planning to do this, and he wanted to make sure. It seems that if he pulled this off, that nobody could track him afterwards. Yes. Okay. Um, how was this discovered? Was this part of the warrant that uh, they served on his house to be able to get that information? Yes, it was. Okay. Do you know if they took Fernando's phones uh, with them? Are they in evidence now? I believe they're in evidence. All right. So for anybody out there thinking about phone information, uh, it's just not relevant uh, to this disappearance because Fernando left his phones at home. And then we know with Pearl's, both of hers were at the scene. Yes. Okay. Um, when the search warrant was served on the house, would you say, once again, we've talked about his family already a little bit, um, did uh, they try to put up a fight? Uh, not letting police in, do you even know anything about that? I do not know anything about that. Okay. Now, something that has uh, come out that is public knowledge, uh, so I need to ask you about it, is once they did serve this warrant... They found that Fernando had written several suicide notes, and I've read, quote-unquote, where they were hidden. Uh, what do you know about them? A any help at all? Any, in, any in, in any of the writings, anything about Pearl or any about wanting to attack a young woman? Anything like that? What do you know about them? The only thing I, I know and I've been able to gather, all the suicide notes they found were they couldn't determine how old they were. Mm -hmm. but at one point he was talking about suicide by cop he was yes okay well that is common these days we see all the videos on youtube and, and elsewhere where the people uh afraid to commit suicide on their own they they go out that way and that really makes it very difficult on police officers all right so he had these suicide notes to your knowledge did he ever attempt uh suicide at any point before getting killed by police that day do you even know? Not, not to my knowledge. All right. Any clues serving a warrant on his house, on the car, any clues at all, any evidence that he was stalking Pearl? I was told that the Sheriff's Department did have a found pictures of Pearl uh, from a distance, mm -hmm. but I, I was never able to confirm that. Okay. The, sheriff's, the Sheriff's won't release the information to me. Right. They tell me they can't because of ongoing investigation. Right. Okay, so we could go back to her comment to you that she made about she thought she was being followed. Maybe yeah. this is, a, but we don't know that for a fact, but maybe this could be what she meant. Could be. Could be. Could be, but she never did specifically said, you know, there's this guy who's taking pictures of me. She never said anything like that, unfortunately. No. All right, so kind of could lead us in that direction uh, because, you know, the tough thing about this disappearance, uh, I think for the listeners, is is going to be, you know, what are the odds that Fernando decided to to attack her and, and take her away on the very day that her brother, you know, kind of lagged behind? Is that a coincidence or is that something that he was waiting for? You know, I know you have your own opinion on it. I have my opinion on it. But I think that's going to be something that um, is going to be sticking out in your mind. Now, you said that you believe this attack would have happened anyway. Right? It would have happened if her brother was with her or not, I, I believe. Okay. All right. So you, you're on the record as believing that. So uh, no clues. Uh, be, although we do have these pictures of uh, Pearl, um, it does seem that, you know, he was following her. Uh, maybe had a, a morbid uh, fascination with her for some reason. We just don't know. The friend just, just does not sound like he was in his right mind at all. And, of course, we know that uh, he's a bad guy. Let's, uh, okay, so let's move to Jenner, California. We have this handwritten directions. Uh, this handwritten directions found in the car or at his house? Maybe. Uh, handwritten instructions were found in, car, in his car. Okay. And um, have the police in the last almost five years gone to that area? You've already talked about one sighting, but um, have they ever been able to check out? Did he know anybody in Jenner, California? Do the Castros know anybody in Jenner, California? Any known significance to that area? Okay, on, on him knowing anybody up there, 
we're not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, they, you know, the shootout happened on the 26th. On the 27th, they were in Jenner, California, searching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. So they've checked it out, uh, Jenner, California. But you know, the tough part about this disappearance is that there's a, an extended period of time where there is no accounting for Fernando and his whereabouts. You know, he could have, yes. you know, he could have driven an hour north of Vallejo. You know, we just, we just don't know. And that's why we're hoping that uh, maybe we can stoke some people's memories, um, you know, with doing this episode for sure. All right. So um, we have the shootout. And, uh, of course, we know that um, he, he died. Uh, and, of course, your opinion is you think that they could have maybe gotten away with this without killing him. Yes, they could have. Okay. Um, you did say, though, that Fernando wrote something on a marker in that house while he was, you know, I guess thinking about making his getaway or if he was even trying to get away. Do you know what he wrote? Um, did the woman who was in the house see what he wrote? Uh, any idea what he wrote? Uh, when he wrote on the table, I was told she was, she had already escaped off the door. Mm -hmm. uh, he started the right song and they could see where he erased it with his arm. Okay. All right. So, uh, he kind of, he wrote something, so it was not readable. It was not legible. No. Okay. So maybe that could have been a clue or something, but then he, Kind of went back and, I guess, changed his mind or something. Okay. The the gun, we know that he pulled a gun on the witness. Uh, there was a gunshot that was heard uh, the morning of Pearl's abduction. Was that gun found? Uh, oh, yeah. They, they found the gun on him. Okay. Um, did it look like, I guess, it had been used? He had actually fired at police, right? Yes. Okay. All right, so they have the gun, and you know if there was this sh uh, shot that rang out um, during the period of time that Pearl was abducted, do you know if that bullet was ever found? Did they do any searches for it? Do you even know? Uh, they, never, they never found no bullets. It was a, my understanding it was a, a Signals 38 that he had, which uh, for those that don't know 38s, uh, mm -hmm. it's a revolver and the shells do not eject. Right, that's right. That's right. And Sub Nose Revolver probably has six shots. And. Um, Sub Nose has five. Five, just five. Okay, so it was this really small one. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. All right, so five shots. One shot was heard. Maybe he had four shots left if we didn't yeah. use it any other place. Um, of course, he could have had additional ammunition. Uh, I, I'm not sure that we know. But. Uh, so they did find. Um, Several rounds of ammunition in this car. And they did. All right. Okay. So regarding uh, his car, now you told me that um, they did open up the trunk. Of course, uh, we would expect maybe looking, unfortunately, for Pearl in the trunk. But yeah. what they found was that, uh, what did they find in the trunk? Okay, um, a section of the carpet was cut out. Um... They found dumbbells in there, uh, zip ties. Uh, when they did the aluminum uh, search of the trunk of the aluminum, yeah. they found specks of blood around the carpet area and on the trunk of the trunk lid of the car on the other side. Wow. And you had told me that a part of the carpet had been taken out? Uh, yes. You, they said you see the outline where he cut it out, and they even um, still the what he cut out there was still able to pick up blood with the. Uh, all right, so we could say possibly that he was trying to remove evidence. Yes. You know, that's, I think that's what's going to, everybody's going to think. All right, so there were signs in the car that, and do you know if that blood has ever been tested to prove that it is pearls? Yes, it was. It was. And uh, the blood that was on the pavement where she was abducted, uh, was that ever tested? Yes, it was her blood. It was hers too. All right. So, okay. Um. All right. So we have the we have the we have all of this evidence. We know that Fernando Castro surely abducted Pearl Pinson, and we just don't know uh, where she ended up. And um, 
we have, we have these pictures. We have some, uh, you know, from a bridge, etc. Kind of uh, being able to put a timeline together, but there are a lot of uh, empty spaces in there. But I think what we're saying here is that if, unfortunately, Pearl's not with us anymore, that if she is to be found, it very well could be that this piece of carpet could be found with her as well. Oh, yes. Together. Okay. Since uh, this all happened uh, in May of 2016, um, the people around Fernando, obviously his family, was in complete denial about uh, his situation and what he might do to somebody. Um, maybe friends, maybe acquaintances, anybody that has reached out to you in, almost a lot, in the last almost five years. Did any of them ever say that he mentioned Pearl? Had he ever mentioned her? Anything? None of his family has ever reached out to me. In, in fact, the day he was killed in the shootout, yeah, um, his sister and one of her, I guess his aunt, came by uh, telling, telling my family that it's our fault that, that their, uh, Fernando was gone. All right, so they were giving you a hard time. Yes, they were. Uh-huh. Yeah, that that's interesting. Okay. But... To once again, to anybody's knowledge, and almost the, like I said, uh, we're doing this uh, in March of 2021, be five years in May. You've never heard anything about anybody coming to you and you said, you know what, I heard F Fernando talk about Pearl once or anything like that. No. Okay. Had he ever talked about any other girls or women about attacking anybody uh, back then in 2016? Uh, like, like I said, he, he was a uh, loner from what I was able to find out, so not very many people uh, had any information on besides he was a loner. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do you think, once again, you've had a chance to think about this, um, what do you think caused him to end up to be on that same street as Pearl on that morning? What, what you know, you've had a chance to think about it. Uh, maybe the, the police have offered up an opinion. Uh, what caused her and him to intersect on that morning? Um, well, for one, if he was watching her, like he, she said, she felt somebody watching her, he could have been there at that, at that corner and watching over her path. Yeah. Right. Right. That's why I said from the beginning, you know, he, he planned this thing out for a long time because there was too much research done. Yeah. You know, for him to, uh, just to do it out of the blue, you know? Mm-hmm. Right, because you've talked about it. Of course, you've said uh, he knew to leave his phones at home for the GPS yeah. uh, situation. He had pictures of Pearl. Of course, you haven't seen them, but that's what you've heard. Pictures of Pearl, maybe from a distance. Uh, we know that he had these directions to Jenner, California, for some reason. Uh, it certainly does sound like he planned to do something, you know, maybe it, with, if not with Pearl, if maybe with somebody else. Yes. Okay. In, in the last almost five years, being that I know that you've done several interviews, James, I know that Pearl's abduction uh, is very well known in your area of California. Have any other women uh, come forward, uh, sent you a message, maybe on Facebook or your family, anybody, uh, saying, you know what, I had a run-in with Fernando as well, anything like that. You know, could, it, could this have been a pattern with him? Uh, no, no one's ever came forward. You know, I've had people, you know, said they think he was the one that was hiding in the bushes, uh, trying to call them in. Um, mm -hmm. Only interaction I've, I've had with any of his friends is on um, Facebook on Pearl's team where uh, people were actually uh, blaming, blaming Pearl for, for the abduction, you know? And that's crazy. That's absolutely, yeah. that's absolutely insane. Uh, any allegations, you know, uh, and the, the listeners know, uh, listeners are uh, very exp experienced missing persons. Um, uh, listeners, uh, they, they know all about all the disappearances that we've uh, covered on Unfound. And I, I'm guessing that some of them are going to think, is it possible that Fernando might have done this before? Any, any other missing young women in the Vallejo, whatever county that is in, those surrounding communities uh, that have gone missing, maybe in the kind of same demographic that Pearl is, that might be able to be connected to Fernando, as that occurred to you in the last five years? 
I, I research and, you know, talk to different people and nothing. Nothing. You know. All right. So if we're to believe that, then this is just was a one off thing for him. Just just on that particular day, this is what he decided to do. Yes. Okay. Um, you know, at times, you know, I was upset with my son at first for not walking with her. But, you know, at time went by to the area. You know, I'm glad he wasn't with her because I, I would probably have lost two kids that day. Because mm -hmm. uh, William would have fought to the death of the protective system. Yeah. Yeah. So we have this um, very large area from Vallejo the whole way down to San Luis Obispo. We have Jenner, California. We have uh, these different counties, Contra Costa County. We have Marin County uh, in Northern California. Uh, where to even begin? I know some searches have been done. I mean, how, how were they even planned? Where have they been done? What has been done uh, back then uh, to try to figure out where Fernando could have put Pearl? Uh, the searches that I know of, they, so far I know of three that they did. Possibly four. Um, they did the one back in 2016. Uh, they had another one um, where the sheriffs were, uh, and the FBI was doing training, so they went back up to Jenner to search for her. Mm -hmm. I was at that one. And um, they had one at Bodega Bay, but they did not let anybody know about that one because uh, they didn't want a bunch of people out there. Right. Didn't want to have any looky loos out there. Yes. You know, sniffing around and just getting in the way and everything. And that does happen. That that certainly does happen. Uh, maybe this is a question I should ask you. Being that this does this disappearance does cover uh, a large area, uh, James, is that uh, do we know where, Jay, uh, where Fernando might have gotten gas during this time? He had to have gotten gas at some point, you know, doing all this driving around. Do we know? I believe he may, may have gotten gas in Bodega Bay. Which is uh, right outside Jenner, California. Okay. Yeah, but uh, I know they did a search of the water in the area of uh, on the Sir Francis Drive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and we have to remember the this area, San Luis Obispo, and some of these areas are near bodies of water. Uh, yes. There's rivers. Uh, of course, in California, you have a lot of a bunch of reservoirs there. Uh, of course, we have the Pacific Ocean. Um, so it's not just looking on land, but could be looking on water as well. Or in yes. water. Okay. All right. So how many searches uh, would you say have been done in the past almost five years, James? I'd say three, three that I know of for sure. Three of them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. Well, it's, as far as I know, they've never uh, searched towards uh, Southern California. Okay. All right. Uh, let's move on to this, James. How bad has the last five years been? One big nightmare. Mm -hmm. That's how that's how I can describe it. Yeah. You know, it's a nightmare, you know, that you can't wake up from. Um, how has this uh, affected, of course, you have your one son, you have an, uh, another child. How has it affected them? Uh, my... <laughs> My son, you know, he worries about her, you know, he, yeah. you know, he prays that, you know, she'll be found someday. Um, my daughter, Rose, Rose's older sister, uh, she's basically giving her life up to search for her, you know, mm -hmm. and to keep, keep her name out there. Um, uh, right. Have you been able, of course, as you would probably know, of course, California is the most populated state. There are a lot of missing people in that state. Have you been able to network with other families? Have you met uh, the parents of other missing, you know, children in California, been able to get some support from them? You give them support. They give you support. Have you been able to do that? Uh, the Pauly Class Foundation, um, they, they helped out with the free flyers and stuff mm. that we, we posted out. Um. I did get a neat Mark class uh, back in 2018. You did? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, the way you look at this, um, you, you think this was, uh, and we know this is a tech, and as you would expect, James, you know, a lot of times, most of the time on Unfound, we only cover unsolved um, disappearances, and most of the time it's a big question whether 
a young woman or a man or, or whoever um, was attacked. You know, a lot, sure. you know, a lot of times it's just a complete mystery. It could be that they just walked off. Could be that they got attacked. We just don't know. Of course, in this one, it's very, very obvious what happened. Um, the way you look at this, do you think that uh, this was preventable? No, I don't. You know, if someone's, if someone's determined, they're coming to do something, they're going to do it. You know. So you just think that uh, Fernando had it in his head, and if it hadn't been on on this particular day, that it would have been just on another particular day, and it just would have been maybe some other young woman. I, I, I strongly believe he had a plan for that day. Yeah. Yeah. And you've been more than clear in saying that there were signs in his private life with his family that something wasn't right and his family chose to ignore it. Yes. You know, if there was, I guess what we're saying here is if there was a chance to prevent something like this happen, happening, it had to have been done by his family because the t by the time he choose to, chooses to go out there and do it, it's too late. Yes. Because he's, he's scheming. He's buying zip ties. He has these things in his trunk. He's doing Google searches. He's leaving his phone. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, he's he, he's set in a direction. If he hasn't done it before, he, he did do good research yeah. on how to get away with it. Yeah, right. All planned out. And, and this is uh, for the listeners. Uh, we, you know, we talk about, you know, disappearances. Are they planned? Are they not planned? It's spur of the moment. And uh, I think for the listeners um, that this is certainly a, an attack that was planned out beforehand. Maybe it, it could have been Pearl, could have been somebody else, but this is what a planned attack uh, looks like for sure, you know, le and then leaving behind all these, uh, this evidence for the police and other people to collect. Okay. Um, James, do you have a Facebook uh, page, website set up, anything like that set up for Pearl? And if you do, please tell the listeners about it right now. Oh, yeah, we have a Facebook page for Pearl. It's called Pearl's Team. Um, it's, it's mainly a, a page, you know, dedicated to Pearl and other missing kids. Mm-hmm. No. Okay. Unfortunately, once in a while, we get people trying to do ad advertisements on it. And yeah. They get deleted. I know about that. Yeah, I, I have that happen on my page and in the, in the discussion group as well. I know all about that. Yeah, it's it's bad. So, once again, why don't you uh, say that name of that page again, James, please. It's Pearl Team. P-E-A-R-L Team. Team. Okay, very good. Uh, do you manage that? Uh, do you take care of that site yourself, or do you have uh, uh, children or somebody else helping you with that? Who is it? Me and my older daughter, uh, Rose. Okay. Yeah, you have to request them, uh, to join the team, and we, we mm. both uh, research the people before we accept their uh, yeah. accept, accept them. You know? That's a good idea. That's certainly a good I idea. I want to make sure we're not dealing with people that. You know, trying to pull scans. We had a uh, one person um, down in um, Southern California, a place called uh, California City, that were uh, claiming that they were pro Vincent. You know, trying to do uh, yeah. fundraising to get money. Yep, it's horrible. Uh, I can't even tell you how many scams I talk to about guests on the program. We don't talk too much on an official interview, but behind the scenes, it is oh, horrible. On there, were um, someone contacted us by a uh, messenger. Um, we turned it over to the sheriff's firm, but uh, they were from Nigeria trying to collect uh, yep. money. Yep. Yep. That's uh, very common. It's so many, uh, so many scammers, con artists uh, out there. It is just uh, unbelievable. I, I don't think the public can even begin to appreciate how much it happens. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's it's horrible. One of the worst things going on. Uh, in our culture is absolutely that for sure. You know, you did talk about uh, this private investigator. Um, when um, I, when did you hire this person? Uh, was this person able to make any headway? How long of a period of time was this person working for you? Before we go, maybe we should talk a little bit about that. Uh, he, uh, he's a private investigator. Um, I can't remember um, this uh, site that uh, hires me, but he does a uh, pro bono work. Mm -hmm. so, you know, he does volunteer work for him. Okay. Any uh, any movement of the case forward at all? Anything? Nothing. You know, he, he, he found out just about as much as I found out, you know. 
Mm-hmm. And well, how long of a time, I, I'm, I'm guessing being that he's working pro bono, that I suppose he could work on it any time he wanted, but when, how, at what point did you decide that that was a good idea? How long into this, uh, when did that happen? Uh, I would like to say within a week after the abduction. Oh, that fast. That's yeah. soon. Okay. That's soon. Okay. All right. Um, well, I'm, I'm glad uh, because private investigators do pop up once in a while, and I think more and more we're learning that uh, that the experience you had with them not being able to find much information is pretty is pretty par for the course. It's pretty yeah. the common, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Yeah, we, had, we, had, we had a bunch of uh, psychics trying to tell us where she was. Yeah. You know, they're all fakes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we don't. Yeah, we don't discuss psychics on the program because they don't solve uh-huh. disappearances. Yeah, the one um, person that's really been involved with the Pearl's case is uh, Misty Sanchez. She's uh, abducted back in the 80s out here in Vallejo when she was eight years old. And she managed to escape from the guy who took her. And so she's been helpful. Yeah, she's been helpful. She has a non-profit um, organization. I can't remember the name of it. Okay. But uh, she, she, we met her the day of the, of the abduction. Wow, she was there that fast. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I'm not sure if I'm familiar with her or not. I don't think I am. I think it does not ring a ring a bell. Uh, okay. Missy um, Sanchez. I can't. Like I said her. Uh, no, probably I can't remember the name of the thing offhand. Uh, okay. Yeah, she did that from day one. Giving us uh, moral support. That's good. Okay. James, any final words before we conclude this interview? That if my daughter's out there, anybody know, has any information, um, please don't hesitate to call call the sheriff's department. You know? mm-hmm. um, and what and know. what sheriff's department is this? What county is this? What sheriff's department? It would be Solano County Sheriff's Department. Okay, Salerno. Solano. Maybe you need to spell that, please. I can't even think of how. <laughs> okay, right maybe it's S O L O L A N O. Maybe something like that. Solano yeah, County, Solano, and that's. Yes. And that's where Vallejo is. Yes. Okay. Very good. Okay. On Pearl Team, and there is a number for the uh, tip line for mm-hmm. Pearl. Um, like I said, I'm just I'm starting to tear up right now. That's okay. Uh, that's fine. Well, uh, I'm sure before they. Uh, everybody hears our voices. I will have linked to the Facebook page many times, and I'm sure the contact information is surely there. That's fine. Okay. Well, James, I appreciate you being on this episode of Unfound. Nice talking with you. Okay. And thank you. You're welcome. And that was my March 21st, 2021 interview with James Pinson, father of Pearl Pinson. I thank him for joining me and all of you on the program. I also need to thank Marky Davis, who made the interview possible. As I stated during the interview, there is now a map video on the Unfound podcast channel on YouTube where I point out all the locations relevant to Pearl's disappearance. Please check it out to help you better understand this case. Maybe you can figure out some new places that law enforcement should search. The first point that occurs to me regarding Pearl's case is this is how quickly a kidnapping can occur. The way it sounds to me, from the point Fernando encountered Pearl to when he got her to his car across the walkway, that time span was less than two minutes. That's it. And had his car been closer, this abduction could have been done in under a minute. Remember that as you compare Pearl's case to others that could be like it that we've covered on Unfound. Maybe the disappearance of Mikhail Biggs comes to mind. The second point is how fortunate we are that there were witnesses, not to mention that one of the witnesses knew Fernando, because this disappearance plays out very much like Juanita Nelson's, another girl who left for school and was never seen again. The difference? There are no witnesses for Juanita's, and this has caused different people, including her boyfriend and even her own father, to be seen as suspects. With Pearls, would we not think the same thing? 
Would there be proof that she even left her house that morning? Would we not suspect that a boyfriend took Pearl away, instead of the stranger that Fernando was? I think we would. The third and last point is, and it's the theme for this episode, if there are disappearances out there in which we suspect people who knew the missing persons as the culprits, but in actuality people who didn't know the victims were the perpetrators, then missing persons cases are even more complicated than we already believe. And this adds in a huge variable that I'm not sure can be calculated at this time. Yet, we have had a number of cases where the circumstances could point to a random encounter between a violent person and the missing person. These could be Jesse Ross, Amanda DeGuio, and Brandy Wells. Of course, the big question is, where is Pearl? Unfortunately, and I think you got the feeling from James, most likely Pearl died on the day of the attack. Fernando had a gun. There was the sound of at least one gunshot. And there was blood at the scene and in the car. All horrible signs. However, I believe with all the planning Fernando did, the directions to Jenner, California, knowing where Pearl would be that morning, not taking his phone or her phones in an effort to hide his movements. I believe that Fernando left a clue somewhere in all that planning as to what he would do with Pearl's body. It just hasn't been found yet. Or maybe a stranger on the street knows something and just doesn't realize it. I'll leave the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound.